watching the Jenny Lynn Show and I am Jenny Lynn Gleave, your host. And today my guest is Stacy Tamaki, my very good friend and blogger. But today she's just going to talk a little bit about her blog and more about her glam pet. Is that correct, Stacy? That's correct. <laughs> and the glam pet is the beautiful little home that's behind us. And uh, our apparel is also <laughs> lending to our story. I am the glamorous part of this interview, and she's the camper. Because the glam, the glamette, the glampet, yeah. the glampet is a glamorous camping mobile. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you. And have you tell us more about all of your wonderful adventures. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. Um, well, I think the first question people usually ask is, why did I want a trailer like this? And it was because I was on the internet one night just surfing, you know, I don't even remember for what. And I came across a blog post by a blogger in Seattle, the Fancy Farm Girl, who had an old vintage canned ham trailer, which is much larger than this. And she had glamped it. And I'm like, what is glamp? And I looked it up and it found out it's glamorous camping. and. That, that'd be so neat, I want one, but my car can't tow something that heavy. And then time passed and one thing led to another and I ended up starting to design a, a, a little tiny one that I hoped my car could tow. And I joined a forum on the internet called Teardrops and Tiny Travel Trailers, where all these people go and talk about building and restoring teardrop trailers, which are similar, but a little bit bigger than mine. Right. And I, I thought, all these people are doing all this work themselves. I'll build my own trailer. So I took a MIG welding class and a metal shop class with the intention of building it and then realized I don't want to build this trailer. <laughs> it's going to be way too much work. And I can't believe you. You actually went and took the classes to build it? I did. It? I you, did. You thought it was like making a dress? Um, I just thought there are steps and procedures. And if I just learn how to do them, I, I would be able to do this. Uh, so I had put my design ideas onto this forum because people will give you really good feedback right. of how, how to do things better. Yeah. And in the course of just getting feedback, I met Fred Markoff, who lives in central Michigan in Greenville. And he was the only person on that forum who popped in and he left me a very long, detailed post giving me just basically free advice on how to do the build correctly. Wow. And so we became friends on the forum. And by the time I realized I don't want to build this trailer after all, I, I was able to ask him if I could hire him to build it for me. And he had designed and built two other styles of small teardrop trailers since 2005. And he'd never done an original design for a customer before. So he was a little reluctant at first. And he took a couple days to think about it. And then he called me back and said, OK, he's you know, willing to, to give it a go. So he started building it for me last December. Amazing. <laughs> Seriously, you know, because it's sometimes when you're dealing with something like this, because it's so kind of out of the box or out of what people normally do. Right. When you take the first steps, I know for me, I would get discouraged and then put it on the side. So I think the most admirable, it's having this desire and giving birth to it by taking all the steps right. to getting it done. So tell us what happened. So you went and met him. Uh, well, so after I talked to him on the phone and convinced him to let me hire him, he took about five months to build a trailer. And every week or every other week, he would send me a batch of photos by email to show me the progress. So it was like I was there and could see, you know, what was going on and certain things. He would send me a picture, like where to place the lights inside the cabin and right. where to put the license plate holder. He'd tape things up and take a picture and email it to me. And then we'd talk on the phone and, you know, I'd say, yes, that's great. Or can we put it there instead? And so I did get to keep collaborating with him even from afar. Um, but he finally sent me an email last, well, earlier this, this spring and said, she's done. And so then I had to drive out to Michigan to pick up the trailer, which was most interesting because I'd never driven outside of Washington, Oregon, and California before. And now I'm taking my dog and heading out to Michigan for the first time across the country. Well, I know lots of adjectives, but I can only say that <laughs> is so gutsy. I mean, seriously, you didn't know the guy who built mm, it, except, no. except from the internet. 
Right. And and to that point, like safety wise, I, I did research, you know, and I, I, I went back. The forums are nice because you can go back usually and read every post a person has ever written. Right. So before we got too involved even in the build process, I had gone back and kind of, you know, skimmed through. I think he'd been a member of the forum for eight years. Okay. And I could just tell by the way other people interacted with him. He was well respected. And then having talked to him on the phone once a week for five months, you know, I, I felt like I had a really good feeling for what kind of person he was. So it was taking a chance, but I, I, I didn't think it was taking a risk right. to, to do that. So obviously this is something you were passionate about because you saw it through to the end. Well, yes. <laughs> at least until you got there. Right. So, you know, when you have a build up in your, in your mind and your heart about something, when you yeah. actually got there and mm -hmm. saw it, how did you right. feel? I was elated. He, it was really funny because he took me into the garage to show me the trailer. And I took one look at it. And my first reaction was, it's even smaller than I thought it would be. I was going to say. And he got worried. And, and then I said, I love it. And he actually let out this audible sigh of relief because all this time he was worried, what if she doesn't like it? Because I'd never traveled in a camper before. I you know, or trailer. Right, I've never right. gone camping before. That's amazing. So a lot of people were concerned, well, what if you get it and you don't like it? But I'd read enough about other people traveling with a tiny right, trailer right. that I had a really good sense I would like it. And then it's turned out I've loved it even more than I thought I would. Because I love the travel on the interstates. I love just driving, you know, for 10 hours a day and seeing the country. So you got there and he had built it to specification, mm -hmm. obviously. And then what did you do? Just put your stuff inside of it and started traveling? Tell us what happened after that. I was there for a few days while he finished. I had my car wired. The thing is, the reason I hired him specifically is I wanted to tow the trailer with my 1994 Acura Integra, which only has a tow capacity of 1,000 pounds. It's a four-cylinder, so it's not you know, a huge gas-guzzling SUV. So the trailer had to weigh less than... Ideally, I wanted it to weigh less than 600 pounds. Right. And the way Fred builds is with a welded frame construction instead of wood. Yeah. So instead of being close to 1,000 pounds, the dry weight on this trailer was 554 pounds. And so my little tiny car can tow it no problem. We've gone through, you know, Donner Pass and Lookout and Fourth of July Pass and Grants Pass in Oregon, and the car tows are no problem. Um, so we were there, I was there for a few days and he finished the wiring between the car and the trailer and then taught me how to drive her, how to tow her and, you know, hitch and unhitch and all of those things. And then I took off and, and just started traveling with her over the summer. Um, I've stayed in really interesting places. I, I started out only staying in RV parks because I just felt like that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, but now it's like I stay at pilot travel centers. I've stayed at a winery and a restaurant. I stay at Walmart parking lots. I just stay everywhere, campgrounds. <laughs> I think this is so awesome. It's almost like, like playing house anywhere and anywhere you choose though. It is, actually. it's like the dollhouse I never had as a kid, but on wheels. <laughs> I can't believe it. So before so. we go on with the interview, I wanted to ask you more about the inside of it. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that we could go in, but sure. it's not going to work out because oh, of the lighting. So okay. would you tell us, like, what's in there? Well, inside is a mattress. I have a three-inch latex foam mattress that is 30 inches wide that both I and my 27-pound dog both fit on at night to sleep. There's a counter and some shelving where I keep my cookware and my food and overhead shelving on the back end right over there and then a lower shelf on the front end Do we here. we have those pictures? Um, oh, yeah. Here we go empty. I didn't put an interior picture full because I thought the camera was going to go in, but I can send you one. Okay. You can add awesome. in later. Um, so the, oh, that shelf right there stores all of my clothes and toiletries and things like that. There's room, normally this little vintage grill sitting between us here on the floor. It fits in there. Yeah. I use it for cooking outside the trailer in the day and at night I use it as a shoe rack so that I could put my dirty shoes on it when I go to bed at night. 
I, ha I do have a porta potty, which is often one of the first questions people ask is how do you go to the bathroom in there? <laughs> it looks like a kid's training seat, right? Like a training toilet. It's really for a child. fancy. I, since I'm not a camper, I had no idea that they now make these porta potties that have a freshwater tank and it flushes just like your toilet at home and they're odor free. So I, I do have a porta potty. It was more of a safety measure mm -hmm. because I thought, you know, if I'm in a campground or in a parking lot and it's midnight or 2 a.m., I might not feel safe to get out of the trailer to go use a public restroom, even if there is not. one. <laughs> so yeah, so I so I got this, and I've only used it on a handful of occasions, but it's nice to know it's there if I need it right. for safety's sake. So we've seen your toilet, and this is your your grand cooking station. This is how I cook right mm -hmm. here. Um, I have a little tiny. It's an ultralight backpacking stove. Okay. So this part just unscrews from the base where the fuel is. And I can put my cast iron fry pan or like this little pot so I can cook, heat, anything, you know, food or beverages using just this teeny little stove. I am just so. blown away. I just love your story. <laughs> so tell me, do you, did you prepare most of your meals or did you eat out a lot? Initially, I just ate out because okay. I was just traveling on the interstates to get to destinations more than camping. Mm -hmm. But then just recently in September, I attended my first tiny trailer rally, which was in Mustin, Wisconsin, hosted by the Camp Inn. They're a teardrop trailer company that make the most beautiful high-end teardrops, I think, right. in the country. And they generously open their rally every year to people who just have tiny trailers. You don't have to own a Camp Inn mm -hmm. to attend. Right. And so Fred had found out about it, and I was already planning a trip back to Michigan a little while later. He said, if you come out a week early, we could go to this rally. So I went, and it was just hilarious because you pull into this, you know, park. This, it's a county park, not a state park. Um, and there's just tiny trailers, you know, everywhere. And so I basically finally learned how to camp after just traveling with the trailer and won an award for coming the furthest from oh my um, dear. anywhere in the is, country is, to attend. Is, are we blocking your award here? It's, yeah, it's oh. the Farthest West Award. <laughs> so that was quite fun and a big surprise. Congratulations, <laughs> that's really huge considering this is your first journey, right? First yeah, voyage. yeah, but at, at that rally, um, I started to learn how to camp, how to cook. Fred taught me because he's done this for years and I learned how to, he taught me how to light my Coleman lantern that was my dad's. Oh, that's one thing I should have, I have asked no you. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. So how do you have lights in there at night? It's just a lantern? There's six overhead lights right now that are on inside of there. They run from a 12 volt battery that's in the tongue box. And then I also had three of these porch lights um, added to both the rear where the door is and on each side. Again, just for safety, most people don't do that. But since I was traveling by myself, I thought it would be better to have more. And you're young and beautiful. So, <laughs> so yeah, so the, the battery in there not only runs the lights, yeah. it runs the vent fan up on top of the trailer so I can blow air in or out. And then there's a little charging station that has three DC outlets and two USB outlets so that I can charge my phone and my camera batteries and things like that at night. I, I, they, you guys thought of every single detail so that you could be comfortable in this thing. Right. So you could live in this. You could. At the camp and rally, uh, they did give some awards because some people have lived out of their trailers for one gentleman eight and a half years, one for four years. I think there's one woman who's been living out of hers for two and a half years. Um, and so people do live out of them long term as well as just do short trips in them. But in terms of um, temperature control in the summer, what's it like? And in the winter, well, you've never had a winter with it, obviously. During the, the summer, it's actually fine because I'm not in the trailer during the day. Okay. One time I did park at a rest stop to take a nap because I, I had got a headache while I was driving. And it was sunny and I was parked in full sun, but I just turned the fan to blow the air out and took an hour long, very comfortable nap. Um, <laughs> The, oh, those are all the different kind of places I've stayed at. I even stayed on Treasure Island uh, just a few weeks ago for a tiny trailer rally there. There are 10 of us that got to spend the night out there on the island. Um, but actually back in June, there was one night in Montana where the temperature went to 40 degrees. And I thought that was cold. But on this last trip back, I stayed in Iowa one night when it was 31 degrees and a 28 degree night in oh Oregon. <laughs> so it gets really cold. And when you walk in the trailer, when you get in, yeah. the air is so cold. 
but I have two blankets for those nights. And then within three hours, your body temperature heats the cabin up so much that I always wake up too hot. So but I, it sounds like it's pretty well insulated. I did get these cute little um, fingerless mittens though, so that when it's 28 degrees, I can go in the trailer at night and still be texting on my phone and <laughs> being on Facebook or, you know, reading a book. Um, and it makes a huge difference to have, have them on. So you just kind of deal with it. If I'm at a campground that has electricity, I can plug in, I have a small ceramic heater that I can plug in and stay warm that way. But when you're parking in a parking lot somewhere, then you just have to kind of tough it out. Well, it's fair to say that you've never really spent the winter in it because you picked it up this summer and this is going to be your first winter. Right. Although winter in California is warmer than fall in Oregon. Oh, so you're not, <laughs> so. Planning, you're not planning to leave California in it this no, winter? No, I, okay. I, I don't think, you know, just for safety's sake, I don't plan to drive with it in the snow. Um, it would be fun to at some point because on this last trip, I finally got to go sightseeing as well after the rally, Fred um, took me along the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and I got to see all these famous places like the Pictured Rocks and Miner's Falls and um, the oh, Two-Hearted wow. River Look and at those pictures. all kinds of, you know, beautiful things I usually don't see because I'm too busy driving on the interstate. I'm looking at a picture now of a waterfall. Where was that? That was in uh, Michigan. That's in Michigan, right on, right along Lake Superior. What, what waterfall is it? That's Which? the Miner's Falls. Oh, okay. Yeah. Look, I mean, th so, that is so the upper, beautiful. The, the upper left picture was Pictured Rocks, which okay. was not far from Miner's Falls. We actually snuck in to see those two things because while we were camping in a different national park, the government shutdown took place. Oh, yeah. And so they tried to shut these areas down by putting barricades up, but yeah. they left enough room for cars to still drive through. And so we, we went ahead and drove through. I mean, I'd driven all the way to Michigan to come see these things. And so we... We kind of snuck in on those. The upper right is, is Lake Superior, which I not, I guess I'd seen one great lake in the past, but didn't realize it. And now after this trip, I've seen four. So, so. after all of, I mean, your story is pretty incredible. And I have to say, definition of tenacity, determination, <laughs> yeah. going after what you love. What would you say is the one thing you wish you would have done differently during this whole process? You know, someone asked me that at the camp in rally, what would you do differently about even designing my trailer? And I said, nothing, like the trailer is perfect. Really? And then I realized the only thing I would have changed was I should have started doing this a couple decades ago <laughs> instead of waiting till this year. That is remarkable. Because I just love it so much. That's what I mean, to have that much love for something, I think that's your definition of having peace and joy in your life, really. It is. And it's not going to take your emotions all over the place like humans do. Right. <laughs> what a great investment, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, so you don't have anything you would change. What would you say is the one experience that stands out the most for you? Well... Um, when I drove back in June, mm -hmm. just after, it was I think three days after leaving Fred's house in Michigan, there was an incident where I was driving down I-90 right. and approaching Gillette, Wyoming, and I saw the most ominous clouds on the horizon line I had ever seen in my life. And I called my mom, I have um, Bluetooth in my car, so I called my mom and asked her, you know, go on the computer and look at the real-time weather report for Gillette. And, tell me, what are these clouds I'm seeing? And she looked and she said, they're, they're rain. It's like green and dark green. It's just rain. And I'm like, okay, well, I've already spent the night and driven through torrential rain the first night after I left Michigan. Right. And so I thought I can drive through rain. And as I drove into this cloud bank, I just thought, oh no, something's wrong. This is not normal. Because as I went under these clouds, it became dark, like almost like you know, twilight, kind of dark, but it was two in the afternoon. And I just got this pit in my stomach and then it started hailing. I was oh, on no. the edge of a, a tornado watch storm. So it was a large hail storm for a tornado storm. And within a matter of about 10 seconds, it was a whiteout hail and rainstorm, just torrential. And I tried to start moving over to get off the right, freeway right. and realized I can't even see what's on the edge of the shoulder. I couldn't even see where the shoulder was. It was so white. 
And then I thought, I don't know what's on the other side of the shoulder. Were like, you scared? If I was scared. <laughs> I thought I should have looked earlier to see if it's an embankment or a cliff or if it's flat. I have no clue and there's <gasps> no way to tell now. Oh my goodness. So I pulled over just far enough where I could barely see the white line and I knew I was on the right side of the white line on the side of the road. And about two minutes later, the hail stopped and I could see it was a field so I wouldn't have fallen over and killed myself. But now there was three inches of hail on the roadway and I had pulled over at the top of an incline just before the, the peak of it. Oh, and so I was stuck in three inches of ice and I had to call the Gillette Police Department. Thank goodness there was reception. <laughs> And they called the highway patrol and they called AAA for me. And 20 minutes later, a wrecker came. That's great, 20 and minutes? Pulled me out, pulled me up to the top of the hill. <laughs> so that was probably the most harrowing um, part of traveling so far. But, you know, I survived. And after that, it was, it was really funny because before that, I had been dreading driving the passes of Montana and Idaho to get to Washington. Yes. And after making it through that, hailstorm I was like bring it on I, <laughs> I can, can drive passes anything. I can do anything now yeah well so. and, and you mentioned to me in a conversation we had earlier about passing a bunch of cows oh yeah what the, where was that and tell us that story so the other kind of odd thing is having never driven across the country before everything just feels surreal all the time I feel like I'm driving through you know, a, a travel book or through a TV show or something because I see things that I've seen on television or in movies and now right. I'm like right there. And so sometimes it's really neat, uh, but on the, the way back in, in October, there had been this freak blizzard in South Dakota where it was three days of 80 degree heat followed by this sudden snowstorm. And apparently, I believe it was like 70 mile per hour winds or something with freezing rain and the cows hadn't grown their winter coats yet. And then the rain was followed by 40 or excuse me, four to five feet of snow. And so tens of thousands of cows froze to death out in the summer pastures because oh, there was no shelter. Sad. It was it's never happened before like that. And so that had happened a couple weeks earlier. Well, when I was driving home, it was so sad because I just kept seeing all these cow carcasses laying in the fields right off Interstate 90, almost the entire day driving through South Dakota. And it, it was kind of funny because one of my friends, Armando, called just to check in and see how my trip was going. And that day, I just burst out in tears when he called me and I'm like, it's awful, it's so sad. It's like all these dead cows everywhere. And, you know, so he kind of talked me down until I felt better. <laughs> but that was, you know, a again, another thing that you see the pictures on the news, you don't ever expect to see it yourself um, in real life. But I did. What an amazing <laughs> experience that was, the yeah. whole, I mean, all of it. And so, I, and when I was listening to you tell the stories about watching these things on television and then or reading about them in a book and actually driving through them. Right. Did you ever have any expectations of what you were going to encounter as you went along because you'd read something or seen something about a, really a city you would go through? No, no. I really didn't. I, I was most concerned when I left with just knowing my way. So I, I do have a GPS right. and I had a, a map, you know. Mm. Um, and I, I was more concerned with safety, really. I had yeah. AAA and I had a cell phone. I have an AT&T phone, which I discovered on Interstate 80 gets almost no reception. So on my second trip, I also bought a pay-as-you-go Verizon phone because right, Verizon right. gets you know better coverage. I had done a bunch of research on how to downshift so that I could drive the passes safely, um, both going up and coming down, so I didn't have to use my brakes a whole right. lot. So I was so focused more on just being a safe driver and a right. safe traveler mm -hmm. that I really didn't um, think too much about what am I gonna see. And now that I've driven, actually, I added it up and I've driven 13,331 miles with the trailer so far since June. Oh um, my God. Now I'm slowing down right. and becoming more of a tourist with it. You know, it, I think it says a lot about our country and how safe our roads are. Because oh, yes. as a woman, to drive cross country with something like this, mm -hmm. and you mentioned staying in parks, and you right. never had any scary experiences. No. You slept through the night, you always felt safe. The, oddly, the safest place I feel is at the truck stops. 
because they're very well lit. There's a lot of people. I stay at usually the pilot travel centers, yeah. not little, you know, no name truck stops. Um, so they feel very, very safe. And, and I do take other precautions. Like I try to finish driving each day by the time it gets dark. So I'm not driving in, during the night. And if I'm staying in an area that I'm really unfamiliar with and it's not right on the interstate, right. then I'll even do a search of the local crime map and make sure the destination I've chosen is in a safe neighborhood. So I, I take precautions. Yeah, it sounds like you took all necessary precautions. Um, but when you stop at the truck stop, say for example, mm -hmm. you're driving somewhere and you think, oh, it's getting dark, I better park for the night. Right. You pull in a truck stop. What do you do there? Say you get there at like eight o'clock and you're, you sleep till in the morning? So what I do, yeah, is I, I actually research. So every night I know where my destination will be that night. Mm -hmm. I don't just drive till I see something. I always have an actual destination when I leave in the morning. And then when I get there, because it is a truck stop, I get out of my car, I park, I get out of my car, I get in the trailer, I lock the door, and I stay in the trailer. Okay. I, I don't get out and wander around. Or So we're running out of time, and um, I didn't mean to cut you off. We're running out of time, but so you always had something inside the trailer to do because you don't have a television set in there, do you? you There's no books? TV. I do have books. Um, okay. This is a collection of books that uh -huh. it's funny. Once you get a trailer, every everyone starts giving you travel books and adventure oh, okay. books. Okay. So I read and and I do have my you know little phone with me and I, I do origami artwork. So I've started bringing paper with me so I can do that while I'm in the trailer as well. Okay. So we're out of time. It always goes by too quickly when I'm having fun. Um, <laughs> I just want you to tell me quickly before we wrap up, what would you say to some young woman who has a desire to do something like this? What advice do you have for her or a young man or I, anybody? I, I think anyone, if they've never traveled across the country before, should, with or without a trailer, just do a road trip and really see America. I, I was shocked. And like I said, I just wish I had done it sooner. But be smart, you know, do your research and stay safe. Don't take unnecessary chances. Thank you so much, Stacey. This is so great. I am so I feel so privileged to share your adventure, your tenacity, your determination, and your fun with my viewers. I hope we can continue on in the life of the Glamet. Sure. And your and your blogging. And so we'll be staying in touch with you. Thank you so much for watching the Jenny Lynn Show. And thank you to my crew, without whom I can never produce one of these shows. So thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Thank you, crew, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.